Okay, welcome to part two of uh, our lecture on uh, John Acumfra, the works, the film works of John Acumfra, with a focus on his 2010 film, The Nine Muses. But before we get into The Nine Muses, I would just like to devote a little bit of uh, attention to his 1996 film, Acumfra's 1996 film, The Last Angel of History. Now this film takes up a number of themes that I can only touch upon here. Among them, uh, the emerging discourse of what has come to be called Afrofuturism, which, uh, very simplistically uh, speaking, is a bringing together of questions of uh, uh, the black diaspora, of uh, af various forms of African culture, or cultures that have emerged from Africa in the diaspora, and the migration of African peoples uh, throughout the world, in relationship to uh, discourses of the future, technology, uh, science fiction, and things like that, So, and utop utopian possibilities. So this kind of conjunction of um, African, traditional African cultures, ideas, philosophies, and so forth, with uh, future-oriented uh, imaginaries and discourses. And this, Afrofuturism, also overlaps or comes into dialogue with um, 90s cyber culture, right? The internet was really starting to emerge in popular culture and popular consciousness, uh, as, as also as a kind of potentially utopian space of free democratic exchange of information and so forth. And so the 90s, uh, the internet seemed in the 90s to embody these kinds of new possibilities uh, for bringing uh, information and people together. In the film, you'll notice in the clip that I will show you in a moment, this reference to the figure of the data thief, um, who is the sort of fictional construct um, that Acumfra and... Uh, his co-creators of the film devised to uh, be this kind of this, this figure who time jumps uh, um, throughout history, um, sort of picking up fragments and pieces of uh, culture in order to construct the possibility of a better future, right? Um, and to articulate uh, and imagine the possibility for um, a future people and a space of freedom and equality. And related to all of this is, of course, the notion of culture uh, as a kind of technology. In the film, you'll hear ref in the clip that we'll see, uh, you'll hear reference to a notion of a black technology, for example. Now, before I show us a clip of the Last Angel of History, I would just like to draw our attention to this notion of the Angel of History, which, in part, a comfort gets from uh, the great German social theorist and critic. Uh, you know, from the early parts to the middle part of the 20th century, uh, Walter Benjamin, who in his last essay entitled On the Concept of History, uh, developed this notion of the angel of history, in which he wrote, quote, a Paul Klee painting, which you see uh, in the slide here behind the text, named Angelus Novus, shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such a violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. So let us take a look at how this storm is sort of reimagined in the diasporic Afrofuturist vision of the last angel of history. Here is a clip, uh, or perhaps we could call it a trailer for the film. We came across the story of a blues man from the 1930s, a guy called Robert Johnson. Now, the story goes that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in the Deep South. He sold his soul, and in return, he was given the secret of a black technology, a black secret technology that we know to be now as the blues. The blues begat jazz. The blues begat soul, the blues begat hip hop, the blues begat R&B. Now, flash forward 200 years into the future. Next figure, 
Another hoodlum, another bad boy scavenger poet figure. He's called a data thief. 200 years into the future, the data thief is told a story. If you can find the crossroads, a crossroads, this crossroads, if you can make an archaeological dig into this crossroads, you'll find fragments, techno fossils. And if you can put those elements, those fragments together, you'll find the code. Crack that code and you'll have the keys to your future. You've got one clue and it's a phrase, mothership connection. Mothership Connection, it's kind of George Clinton's obvious, uh, it's his 1974 album in which uh, you have uh, an alien, you have George Clinton who's like an alien in kind of silver foil and he's kind of getting out of the spaceship. You can't work out whether he's getting out of the spaceship or getting back into the spaceship. By this time, black music had, black itself had become commercial. You know, it was hip to be black, you know, into the music, you know, the dance bands of James Brown and uh, all of that. So, and hip hop, I mean, rock and roll had just like faded out, you know, in 69. So it was time to make a change. Greg Tate is the writer who argued that black people uh, in America certainly lived the estrangement that uh, science fiction writers kind of uh, talk about. All the stories about alien abduction, all the stories about alien spaceships taking subjects from one planet and taking them to another, genetically transforming them. Greg is really saying, Greg is kind of recasting American history in the light of science fiction and saying, well, look, all those things that you read about alien abduction and genetic transformation, they already happened. How much more alien do you think it gets? than slavery, than these, than entire mass populations moved and genetically altered, entire status moved, uh, forcibly dematerialized. It doesn't really get much more alien than that. Okay, so now we will shift to uh, Comfort's 2010 film, The Nine Muses, which again, I asked you to watch for this week. So in his text, Memory and the Morphologies of Difference, um, I think Akumpra provides us with a useful entry point into uh, his specific project in uh, The Nine Muses. So Akumpra writes, the moment, the symbolic moment of our becoming is a date in 1948, I think in September, when 348 men and only men came on a boat from the Caribbean. The boat was called the Empire Windrush, and it was the beginning of a certain symbolic rupture in British memory. Up until then, Britain had been marked by a particular narrative definition of its identity. The Empire Windrush marked a break in that narrative. Basically, the narrative went something like this. Britain is an empire, and all of its subjects are British. If you are African or Asian, you live in the colonies, in the periphery. If you are white, you live in the metropolitan center. We are all children of the empire, loved equally by our dear king. The arrival of that boat broke the connection between the body and the narrative. It shattered the symbolism of that narrative by dislocating body from location, by displacing the connection between space and identity, and in doing so started the process of multiculturalism as a demographic fact. My generation will become the permanent reminder of that rupture. We will be the sign, the trace, the emblem of that profound cultural, political, and psychic transformation of the British tableau and its increasingly post-colonial mise-en-scene. And so the, one of the first key concepts I think we can uh, used to unpack some of the uh, rearticulation of this British transformation, this post-colonial transformation that Akumpra is discussing, is this notion of counter-mythology. And uh, perhaps uh, simply put, we could say that it, we can understand this counter-mythology as a kind of revisiting and repurposing of canonical, which is say classical and modern Western and in most cases, specifically English figures, myths, and texts that the film draws on. And these include Homer's The Odyssey, uh, William Shakespeare's The Tempest, uh, the famous uh, English poet, English Republican poet uh, from the 17th century, John Milton, uh, his text, uh, epic text, Paradise Lost, um, the 20th century poet T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and finally Samuel Beckett, the Irish uh, 
novelist and playwright, his text, The Unnameable. All of these, all of these texts and figures are drawn from in the Nine Muses, and it's interesting also to think about how the 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 um, the voiceover in part of the film is composed of these texts by way of these Naxos. Naxos is a company uh, that did these audio recordings of these texts, right? So the the Naxos recordings uh, of the Odyssey, the Tempest, etc., are the provide some of the sonic, oral, textual framework of the Nine Muses. Now, Cass Banning, in her article, The Nine Muses Recalibrating Migratory Aesthetics, uh, helps explain uh, the significance of the notion of the Nine Muses uh, itself uh, uh, for the film. She writes that the Nine Muses, the film, is split into nine sections, each dedicated to one of the Greek muses. As the film reminds us, Mimesin, the great go Greek goddess of memory, slept with Zeus, king of the gods, and gave birth to the Nine Muses. And so the film groups its themes into titled sections, such as Calliope, the muse of epic poetry, beginning with Milton's Paradise Lost, Cleo, the muse of history, and Polyhymnia, the muse of song, which includes songs by Paul Robeson and Leontine Price, among others. And now in his interview with Power, uh, Acumpra also explains uh, the significance of the use of poetry in particular in his, in, in his film. He writes, or he says, People asked me why I quoted Milton and Beckett and the other writers in The Nine Muses. It was partly because I liked the poems, but there was also something that connects all of them. Paradise Lost is a monumental exposition of precisely that transience, that ontological transience that we were interested in. Paradise Lost is about man's first disobedience. We are born in that moment of flux, and we never really move out of it. And this isn't a migrant speaking. This is the major poet of the English language who understood this. And so we have here, right, a come for us sort of repurposing, right, appropriating the uh, text, then the logic, the grand ontological claims about the fallenness of man uh, from Milton's Paradise Lost, which was written in, a, you know, the 17th century, uh, which is about the fall of man, the Garden of Eden, the war between uh, you know Satan uh, um, and God, and so forth, um, and how this imagery is taken by Acumpra as to be a kind of allegory for the diasporic experience of uh, African, Afro-Caribbean, Asian, South Asian, and so forth subjects coming to the British imperial center in the post-war world, right in the modern world. And so Acumpra sort of is translocating this story and using its mythical, uh, poetic imagery to articulate something about uh, the migrant experience. So this then takes us to counter mythology and modern migration, in which again we have the quoting and repurposing of modern and imperial notions of exploration, including among them the figure of the wanderer, which we will remember from uh, Caspar David Friedrich's uh, Wanderer of the Above the Sea of Fog, uh, which we discussed uh, last week in the films of Werner Herzog, right? We looked at this notion of the so-called Rukin figure, the figure seen from the bank. And of course, in many of the sequences in uh, The Nine Muses, we also have a comparable figure of the Wanderer. Except, again, much in the same way that uh, Acumpra is drawing from Milton's Paradise Lost and its ontological transience, sort of uh, relocated and or displaced to the migrant experience, we have the, the, the codifications of the wanderer, the questions of the sublime, of perhaps ecstatic truth, and so forth, to draw on Werner Herzog, uh, re-signified through the lens of the migrant, right? These ghostly, perhaps these hooded figures uh, that we see here on the right in the Nine Muses, also looking off into this murky, smoky uh, distance. And so Acumpra has explained this uh, imagery in terms uh, uh, that I think can help illuminate uh, what's going on here in his interview with Power. And Acumpra says, I wanted to make familiar, to dramatize something that's absolutely present in all our lives. What most of us settled people suppress is that the migrant life is a real thing. Who am I? Where am I going? What is this place? What is this moment? It's not just West Indians and Indians in the 1950s and 60s asking those questions. They're caught up in those questions. Their lives are a living monument to those questions. So you look at how they're living and how you're looking at how everybody else is living. I'm not making some bogus claim to universality, but if you ask me what animated the film, that's what I would say. This interest in transience, the journey, these endless states of being, 
seem to me to mark migrant lives. And so we can link this notion of counter mythology to um, a Kumper's use of archival images and his attempt to draw out uh, uh, other aspects or occluded aspects, forgotten aspects, regress, uh, repressed aspects of memory, of a people's memory, of migrant people's memories, of black British memories, for example, uh, in the Nine Muses. And I've called this also um, Acumpra's counter-archival practice. So among the things we could think about in the Nine Muses is how Acumpra appropriates archival or found footage from the official British uh, state archives, from places like the BBC, among others. And we can think about how he repurposes images of the so-called Wind Windrush generation, uh, that ship that arrived in Britain in 1948. We can think about how he revisits footage previously used as well in his film, Handsworth Songs, which we saw an example of uh, in the previous part of this lecture. And we can think about how he plays on what Jamie Barron, in an article entitled The Archive Effect that we read weeks back, calls the plays with these notions of intentional disparity manifest in the way that the Nine Muses produces what Barron calls the archive effect. Barron writes, get, uh, this archive effect uh, is, is in part, and it's the intentional disparity that emerges, is manifest in a gap between the then, the pastness of the document, and the now of the appropriation film's production made evident within the film. This she wrote on page 109 to 110. And she goes on on page 113, quote, archival documents, if the viewer recognizes them as such in an appropriation film, thus always generate a sense of multiple contexts and double meaning, even if these are vague and indeterminate. In other words, the very fact of the recontextualization of the found document in an appropriation film creates the opportunity for multiple readings of that document, end quote. And so one of the things I just want to suggest here is we have migrant figures and a migrant people, right, a people, a transient people, and what we have corresponding in a way with this in, in a compass practice is the migration of documents themselves and their meanings, the transience of documents, the double meanings that these official archival records of images and so forth and sounds can also be rearticulated, are themselves in movement, are themselves in transience. And so Acumpra develops this idea in his interview with Power, writing, what does it mean to examine, uh, uh, excuse me, this is Power herself, what does it mean to examine the archive as it represents, or rather half represents, you as the subject, rather than the agent of immigration? The question of the archive has always been central to Acumpra's work, how it is possible to open up an image, to detach an image from the narrative and the chronology of which it used to be a part. And so what, uh, what Power is describing here in uh, The Nine Muses, of course, we also saw in the Black Audio Film Collective's Handsworth songs, in which uh, the uh, filmmakers, the artists, are slowing down the narrative, the reading of these, these the uh, Handsworth riots in 1985, in order to rip them out, as it were, to detach them from the specific narrative, the specific reading of them as, for example, as quote-unquote race riots, Right, and to understand and there's that particular chronology in which they're placed, that particular story, that particular timeline in which they're placed and made intelligible, and trying to produce at least the possibility of understanding them in another way, of putting them into a different context, perhaps a larger sociological context about uh, again class relations, race relations, racial injustice, segregation, and so forth in post-war Britain. And so Cass Banning then, in her article on the Nine Muses. Uh, describes uh, Acumpra's method of appropriating and reusing archival images. She writes, Ventriloquist-like, Acumpra strips the patrician voice of God from the original footage housed in official repositories of record, layering voices and adding supplementary narratives, lyrically rendering an emergent newfound humanity and innate agency for subjects caught on celluloid to serve radically different ends from a past era. Throughout the film, Throughout the film, uncannily approximates an ambivalent state of becoming, the articulation of becoming, of the Windrush generation becoming Black British. And so we really have this, the, the, the poetry of these, also of these images. So there's a critical side, right, this critical rewriting of history. And then, of course, I think it's really significant to emphasize in a compass practice, and this is what Banning is also drawing attention to here, the lyrical, poetic, uh, perhaps we could also call it ontological aspect that a comfort is interested in. This production of these beautiful, in a way, monumental images of a people, uh, of its movements, of its memories, uh, 
and this is something that was also, you know, is, is, was heavily sidelined or neglected or non-existent in traditional British culture, right? So Comfrey, in, in other ways, as much as there's a sort of melancholic and, and or critical dimension to his use of the archive, there was also this equally poetic uh, investment in, in beauty, in beauty in a very expansive sense. And so, in relationship to counter-archive and counter-memory, we have the appropriation of canonical images and logics of community from the classical period of British cinema, specifically documentary films made during the Second World War, right, made during the period from 1940 to 1945, which was called, uh, you know, has come to be known as the so-called People's War. And so what we have through these, um, in the film The Nine Muses, and this appropriation of these, some of these images from these wartime films showing us the people's war, we have this repurposing of well-established British myths of community, nation, land, neighborliness, and so forth. And this is why Banning will write, quote, the spirit of Britain's most celebrated documentarian of the same period, Humphrey Jennings, uncannily inheres in the familiar footage of bombed out London's smoldering buildings that recalls his film Fires Were Started. Yet it is Jennings' film Listen to Britain, with its finale of wartime Britons coming into nationalist belonging through the seemingly simple, simple sway of couples dancing in a ballroom, moving bodies and sounds swelling into a crescendo of unified purpose that resonates most adroitly here. There is a sense that these canonical British texts resonate beyond archival fodder. It is as if the sensibility of the earlier era's experiments with sound and image are perversely invoked and conjured to approximate a shared phenomenological experience, but of a different sort, one's fundamental chilled aloneness, once grounded on British shores. So, right, we have a comfort sort of re using these images that would, uh, you know, that were made during the war to help generate um, morale, wartime morale, morale, as the British people, you know, endured. Uh, nightly fire bombings, for example, of uh, London and various other major cities by the Nazi uh, Luftwaffe, uh, right, uh, during what was called the Blitz, for example, these images in these documentary films that were used to help people, you know, sort of work together, see images of themselves struggling to feel, you know, some sense of national community. What Banning is seeing in the Nine Muses is how Acumfra is sort of using these images to then show us how we have these new people, you know, these other people inhabiting Britain, these migrant peoples inhabiting Britain, with also uh, expectations of community, of belonging, and so forth. But then, you know, uh, experiencing it in this sort of the this experience of isolation, which and coldness, right? This metaphor of coldness or chilliness, which of course we have in these the images uh, shot uh, in. Um, these sort of Arctic wastes of Alaska that we have of these hooded figures wandering around in the snow, right? And so we have this kind of complex interchange of this uh, uh, longing for community here. And this is why then I want to draw our attention to this one example of uh, these, this one sequence in Listen to Britain where we have these two, uh, what we believe on the left, we see on the top left here, are these two people, they at first perhaps appear to be civilians enjoying the sunshine, or excuse me, enjoying, enjoying the sunset, and then uh, we later see that they are in fact soldiers looking out uh, you know, into the horizon for enemy uh, Nazi um, uh, airplanes coming to do a bombing, right? So these are actually soldiers uh, who are on duty uh, um, you know, looking out for something that could, you know, an enemy that's something uh, from the outside that's going to invade the inside. But of course, we have a similar sort of image uh, um, on the bottom here in the Nine Muses of a figure looking out into the distance. Um, but what we could think about is how a comfort at once is borrowing the same kind of tableau, the same mise-en-scene, you know, or very, a very similar mise-en-scene of a figure with, with his or her back to us, like the Rukin figure, like the Wanderer, right, Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer. But we also have this sense of this figure, if read with Listen to Britain, of John Comfort's figure in the Nine Muses of looking toward the island of Britain, right? So whereas Jennings' uh, civilians and soldiers are looking out to the horizon for the uh, enemy approaching, what we have perhaps in um, the Nine Muses is the figure looking towards the island of Britain, searching out for signs of home. This is one potential way of reading the sort of complex exchange of imagery and mythology that we have in the Nine Muses. And so to conclude, I would just like to turn to a quote that, is, that uh, Banning includes in her article uh, from the um, 
post-colonial theorist uh, Akil Mbembe, uh, he wrote an essay that was published in 2002 entitled The Power of the Archive and Its Limits. And he writes in that article, uh, quote, examining archives is to be interested in that which life has left behind. It is to be interested in debt, following tracks, putting back together scraps and reassembling remains. It is to be implicated in a ritual which results in the resuscitation of life in bringing back the dead to life by reintegrating them in the cycle of time in such a way that they find in a text a place to inhabit it from where they may continue to express themselves. And so to conclude, I just want to emphasize again, uh, to conclude this part of the lecture, to emphasize again this dynamic relationship between archival images, the work with archival images, the, the reuse of archival images, the bringing the, of them to, in, together into new relationships, new configurations, deconstructing their meanings and then elaborating new constructions and new meanings of, and questions of possibility out of it, is also an attempt to construct a place that one can live within. To live within the image, but of course also to live within uh, modern Britain. So uh, we will now turn to the third part of the lecture.